do you think that we're ever going to be able to understand what, you know, what level of estrogens that we need to optimize a particular performance or what blood levels of progesterone we're going to need? You do make a very insightful statement in that it's not just the amount that we're getting, but also the receptors and the clearance. Yeah. Where do you think it's going to go in the future? How can we start to look at potentially athletes, individuals, blood labs, and target treatment? Yeah, I think it has to come back to the individual. I, I really think we have to look at the individual because if we look at an example of, let's say, a female athlete, and we think of... Um, Let's just make a little like case study here. So we have a female athlete. Well, we we do have a case, we do have a case oh, study, but maybe you? we won't talk about. It. We do. Oh, okay. maybe we can. Uh, she can remain nameless if she wants. I'm sure she she wouldn't want to, but uh, we'll, we'll we'll leave her nameless for now. Okay. Um, but I was uh, so. Don't think it's the same one we're talking about, but uh, <laughs> for our purposes, for this little kind of example, let's say we have a female high performance athlete that had her first menses at age 13. Um, so 13, very average onset of menses. You actually have an influx of particular uh, steroid hormones even before that first bleed. Uh, estradiol typically is about one year, but it varies across individuals. Androstenedione, dione, which is an androgen, it increases for about that first year, but it varies across individuals. But let's just say that she went on, uh, got put on a hormonal contraceptive about six months or maybe four bleeds after the first bleed. And she was on a hormonal contraceptive um, from the time that she was 13 and a half all the way to 28. Okay, then she goes off and through you know, various means is able to, uh, over time, regain a ovulatory menstrual cycle. So in this example, a couple of important things to take out is one, that individual did not have exposure to progesterone. Uh, we know that in that first about seven to 10 years after uh, menarche or the first bleed, that it's very likely that we're going to have a high fluctuation rate. You know, it's the roller coaster of hormones and that you're more likely to have anovulatory menstrual cycles um, as your body is really learning and adapting and figuring out how to develop this really complex system of, of just so complex in terms of how it relates to internal and external factors. But when you're on a hormonal contraceptive, you start stop the ability to ovulate. So you're exposed to a synthetic progesterone. So it's spelled totally different than progesterone. Um, the molecule does not look the same and it doesn't act the same. Um, moreover, the typically, I mean, there's some newer formulas of contraceptives that are now using um, a more of a bioidentical uh, estradiol, but by and large, ethanol estradiol uh, is like the major number one kind of synthetic estrogen that's used in contraceptives. And that has been shown to be quite a bit more potent um, than what our bodies naturally make. So we have this individual who never had the opportunity to make and get exposed to natural endogenous levels of estradiol and estrone and estriol and all those metabolites and also didn't get the exposure to progesterone. Then she comes off. It's going to take a little bit for her body to get used to not only making, but receiving, metabolizing her own endogenous hormones because they look different. They act different. I mean, there's a beautiful body of literature, especially within um, neuroscience that has looked at just how different the synthetics used in contraceptives are compared to our own natural endogenous hormones. But long story short, one thing that you know we can take away from this is that that individual may have a different, let's say, muscular response to a synthetic hormone than a bioidentical, what her, her own body is making hormone. And this could massively impact performance outcomes. So it's really hard to study then how optimal levels might be because for in a case like that she might feel particularly and i don't know if you've seen this in your own practice i've seen this in my own work though where you see people that are kind of trying to make hormones again after they've been really deficient for a while and that they do have more of a magnified kind of somatic response as their body is getting used to 
making progesterone again or making estradiol again. And even if you test serum levels, even if you do a, I mean, a very robust, let's say once a week lab test for LH, FSH, estradiol, um, that you can, you'll see that even at low levels on serum testing, they will reflect with higher kind of symptomatic of elevated estradiol levels because their body's just not used to it. And so that individual might feel great on suboptimal levels initially. And then as her body gets used to it, things get back into uh, flow. She might then feel much better at what we would consider to be like more optimal levels. So, you know, long story short, I don't think we can define these really rigid ranges. Um, I truly don't because there's just way too much individual variance, um, particularly when we look at that female population and just recognizing the amount of individuals that probably do have regular anovulatory cycles. They're going to feel a lot different on very low levels of progesterone than what they would be getting if they actually ovulated, you know, that 600 and up range. So just, you know, no, I don't think we can. And I, I think they're going to keep trying and keep not being successful. Uh, and what you're saying is when a young athlete goes on oral contraceptives, it shuts down their natural ability to produce hormones, which while they're still getting a regular cycle per se, regular from an external perspective, from the patient's perspective, uh, physiologically, it's not uh, exactly the same. It's not the same kind of, quote, natural cycle. The hormone fluxes, the body's ability to make and maintain their own hormones are, are different. Mm -hmm. You're also saying yeah. that it potentially impacts performance or potentially impacts musculature. Mm -hmm from a young age. Am I hearing you correctly? Absolutely. And you know, what's, what's been interesting is it's not just musculature, it's also adiposity and uh, fat-free mass or fat mass. Um, they've also seen substrate utilization be different. Um, and it varies actually with different forms of contraceptives. There are certain uh, progesterins particularly that are more pro-metabolic or like kind of anti-metabolic. Uh, and it varies how long an individual is exposed to them, what their reproductive state was before initiating how long they were on and at what, what dose. So that's where it makes studying them so complicated because there are so many different variables involved. Um, and that there's, I mean, even for muscle recovery, um, they've seen higher rates of like C-reactive protein after exercise in elite athletes uh, that were on hormonal contraceptives. They've seen alterations with different um, bone structures, depending on the type of contraceptive and when it was initiated. Um, and so these are all variables that will alter and change how somebody's performance, uh, how we're able to kind of optimize it when we actually start looking at what is affected. And would you over, would you overarching say that you don't recommend young athletes or athletes in general to go on oral contraceptives, that there are potentially better ways to manage symptoms, pregnancy, yeah. all the things? Yeah. So I am, at the end of the day, I'm a feminist and I believe in women's rights and I believe in access to um, birth control. I don't agree with blindly giving individuals a pharmaceutical that could potentially change their life without talking about the risks and without educating them so that that individual can make their own decision. I think informed consent is an incredibly important part of this conversation that has been completely left out in part due to like just this incestuous relationship between researchers and pharmaceutical companies and everything else. So I do believe that um, there are better forms of contraceptives. Yes, absolutely. I do agree that there are better forms of, let's say, managing um, a menstrual cycle that is maybe not optimal or symptom-free for an individual. We have to ask why before just going on a substance. Um, and the thing about contraceptives is that there is very easy access to them. And so individuals may go on them because they're just not educated that there might be a better option for them. Um, or they might think that it's just, you know, it's just for now, it's not going to be forever, not recognizing that, hey, depending on all the other things that make up who you are, there may be more long-term implications, particularly maybe if you haven't had a regular ovulatory cycle um, prior to going on, or if you start it too young. I do agree that there, the age of onset needs to be pushed. Um, you know, if you look back in, again, going back to some of the historical stuff, if you look back in time, they it was never intended to be a drug for young girls and women. Um, that was never, it was actually 18 was the initial cutoff. Um, 
depending on where people were. Meaning, meaning the cutoff of starting, starting or the yeah. cutoff. Yeah. So there was, you were, had to be over the age of 18 and other countries, it was even as high as like 22 years old. Um, and initially it also was only intended to be used for about six months or so. And they kept just pushing that time, pushing that time, pushing that time, even when there were voices speaking out against it. Um, just like with some of the issues with long-term like uh, sterility or infertility post-use. Um, there were people pushing back about that, but they got definitely suppressed, um, unfortunately, within the literature. And you just see that age. You see the indications going up too. Initially, they were intended actually for, um, I mean, it's just a cra- stranger than, than friction. Like it's just the craziest truth to how contraceptives develop. 